is just basically show you how to do two more kinds of hydrolyte simulations. One of them to read in your own data like AC9 data files and one of them to simulate case two uh, waters where you build up the components piece by piece. So to get started, if you look in the, uh, hang on here, and we'll, we'll take a look at these files, but in the hydrolyte technical documentation, and I can assure you after 15 years of supporting hydrolyte, no one actually reads the user's guide, but uh, anyway, there's a whole chapter here called standard format data files. So any kind of data file that you might want to read into Hydrolyte has a standard format. So it's chlorophyll data, it's bottom reflectance data, AC9 data, backscatter data, sky irradiance data, whatever there is. And so basically you put your data on this standard format and then you can give that file to Hydrolyte and it will know where to find things. So if you want to look, it's chapter seven in the technical documents, but we don't need to look at that right now. On the other hand, if we go to the HE5 data directory here and look in here, then there's a directory called examples. And in there is an example of all of these different kinds of data files. So if we just open that guy up, so here's an example of how to read in AC DOM data, AC9 data, AC filtered, uh, you know, chlorophyll Z data, hydroscat data, or, and this really should be called BB data, um, you know, with or without water irradiance data, so on and so on. So let's just look, for example, at the chlorophyll Z data. And it says in all of these standard format things, Hydrolyte is going to skip the first 10 records. And don't just leave a blank line, because if you do, it's hard to count the records. And you have like 11 blank lines instead of 10, and then that throws Hydrolyte off. And you know it gives you some weird error message, because it was expecting to see a data record, and it saw a blank line. So anyway, at least just number them 1, 2, 3 through 10. But those lines are for you to put any kind of documentation about the file, you know, station numbers, dates, how you processed it, whatever. So Hydrolyte will just say, skip the first 10 files, and then depending on what kind of data it is, there will be some standard format. So for chlorophyll data, it's just pairs of depth and chlorophyll, depth and chlorophyll, and then finally, and I just made these numbers up, but you know, the last chlorophyll value was at 25 meters. And then I always put another record in the thing you're reading here is going to be probably either depth or wavelength, and that's always positive. So Hydrolyte is set to say, if I find a negative depth or a negative wavelength, I know I'm done, and you know, here's my data. So that's a chlorophyll file, for example. If you open, let's say, here's an AC9 file. Well, the way that guy works is basically the same. There's 10 records to do whatever you want, and then Hydrolyte expects the 11th record to be the number of wavelengths and the list of wavelengths. Now with an ACS, that might be 80, and there's 80 wavelengths out here, but that's the way it works. Then thereafter, you're going to get a record where it's the depth and then the nine absorption wavelengths. And if we go on out here to... Here's uh, AC, the, the ninth absorption. They're all zeros. It can kind of tells you they did their scattering correction by assuming the absorption at 715 was zero. And then here's now beam attenuation at 412, 443, and on out. So in this case, with an AC9, there's always the nine absorptions and the nine attenuations for the given depth and Hydrolyte assumes that you have subtracted out the pure water values. So when it reads this file, it's going to add pure water back in. It just the way it works, yeah. The separation between columns, that just uh, These are just spaces. Um, Fortran, I recommend that you not use tabs, and the reason is sometimes Fortran freaks out 
and it sees the tab as like a character instead of a tab. And I've never figured out when it works and when it doesn't, but I just always leave a couple of blank spaces here, or at least one blank space. And then it will read this as a free format record, but it won't get messed up with tabs and stuff. Um, and the other thing is when you create these files, let's say you're working in an Excel spreadsheet, so you reformat things, and then you say, save this as an ASCII or text file. Don't save it as a Unicode file when you actually want to save something. Uh, yeah. That's the wavelengths. It's saying there's nine wavelengths. They're 412, 440 through 715. No, that's the 11th one. So there should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Those, it's going to skip. And then it always expects the 11th record to be the wavelengths. Make sense? So the, so the first thing that it reads is the 9. Yeah, yeah. It's going to skip the first 10. And then for an AC9 file, it expects the first data record or the 11th record to be how many wavelengths and what they are. And then from there afterwards, there'll be depths and the AC9 thing. And if you go down to the bottom here of this file, what I, well, in this case, there's zeros. Sometimes all I do is I just copy the last record and paste it in and then change the depth to minus one because it's not going to use that data anyway. I'm just flagging that that's the end of the data. Okay, uh, the catch is when you go, uh, let's say you're in an Excel spreadsheet and you have all your data here and you now say, I want to save this as a text file. Don't save it. Let's just see if we look here. Save as, uh, yeah, this doesn't give me all the options. Let's just fire up Excel here. Okay, so if I go to Excel, no, oops, did I hit, oh, sorry, I hit, uh, I hit the browser, not, I would never, here we go. Okay, in Excel, you've got a bunch of data, you do a save as, and you say, as file type, pick the one that says text MS-DOS. And don't pick text Macintosh. Don't pick comma-separated values. And yeah, don't pick Unicode text, because that sticks these extra characters in there that you don't see when you open the file in a text editor. But they're there, and then hide the Fortran read statement will find those extra characters and you know things get weird and you get some bizarre error message so just save things as text ms dos uh, when you're working in something like an excel spreadsheet okay and then uh, enough said there whoops okay so like i say anything here here's now let's just open this one so here's some backscatter data. Once again, 10 records. Now there's six wavelengths. Here they are. And here's now the depth and the backscatter coefficient at those six wavelengths. And there's an option in hydrolyte. Generally, people do not remove water from backscatter data because it's usually negligible. But some people do. So when you run hydrolyte, it'll ask you, does your backscatter data include water or not? And you can check yes or no, and then Hydrolyte knows whether or not to add backscatter by water into your data before it uses it. Okay, so enough on that. So, um, well, actually, no, let's do one more. Here's some mineral data. So before we had a chlorophyll file with depths and chlorophyll values, now I've got a mineral file of some kind of minerals, and I've got the concentration, depth, concentration, da, da, da. And a little note that these are grams per cubic meter. Now, the normal thing 
with chlorophyll is in its milligrams per cubic meter. So all that matters is that you have the concentration, whatever it happens to be, so concentration times the mass specific absorption or scattering coefficient, let's call it A star, that simply has to give you units of one over meters because absorption coefficients are one over meter and we're going to create an absorption or scattering coefficient. So the chlorophyll is usually milligrams per cubic meter and the chlorophyll specific absorptions are going to be the absorption coefficient divided by the, the chlorophyll concentration. So this is one over meter divided by milligrams per cubic meter gives you these weird units of meter squared per milligram, which looks a little strange, but that's the units of an A star, a chlorophyll specific absorption. Well, the bottom line is when you take a concentration in milligrams per cubic meter, multiply by an A star in meter squared per milligram, now you end up with one over meters and you have an absorption coefficient or scattering coefficient. For mineral particles, people usually measure mineral concentrations in grams per cubic meter. So in hydrolyte, there are some example mass specific absorption and scattering coefficients for mineral particles and they're in units of uh, meters squared per gram and so I need to read in a concentration that's grams per cubic meter so that when I multiply the mineral concentration in grams per cubic meter concentration of the minerals times the mineral uh, mass specific absorption or scattering, I still end up with one over meters, which is all the radiative transfer equation cares about. So there's little things uh, like that that are a little tricky, but you get used to them uh, once you've screwed it up once and, and asked me what went wrong, and then I tell you, oh, here's what happened. Okay, so enough said there. So let's do a hydrolyte run now. And where is it here? Let's fire this up. And so let's just call this, I don't know, we'll call it uh, day two, day two, uh, run one, whatever. And this is going to be an uh, example of AC9 and BB data, something like that. All right, so we come along. Now we're going to read in our own AC9 and backscatter data and so forth. So for the IOP model, we'll pick the one that says, I have measured IOPs. They're obtained from standard format, user supplied AC, and optionally BB data. All right, so pick that guy, bingo. And now what comes up is it says, we're going to have three components here pure water. Component two is everything else. When you have an AC9 unfiltered, you know, it's just whatever's in the water. It's phytoplankton, minerals, CDOM, whatever. So that's going to be what you're reading from the AC9. Now, you may also have a filtered AC9 that is just the CDOM absorption. And if you have that, you can read that in as a filtered AC9 file. The only time you need this is if you want to include CDOM fluorescence because up here you're getting all the IOPs and if you want to include CDOM fluorescence in a run where you're reading in your own data, you need to tell it how much CDOM is in the water. And you could get that from a file of AC9 data but a filtered AC9 so that its values are only the CDOM part, not everything in total. So it only uses this for CDOM fluorescence calculations. All right, so let's just click here. We're going to use the default seawater IOPs and whoops, 
Yeah, here we go. So now it says, okay, you want to read some AC9 files, give me the name of your file. So if you look at, let's see here, uh, I, you know, let's just go right here. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I need you. Yeah, here we are. Here's what I want right here. Okay, if you look in the HE5 data directory, there's a one called user here. That's made as a convenient place for you to stick your own data. And when Hydrolyte said, when you say, I want to read in my data, that's the default directory where it goes. Now, you don't have to use that. You can browse off to wherever your data are on your computer. But that is there. Okay, so let's say I want to read in a file of AC9 data, and I remind you, it must have the pure water values removed. So we search for this guy, and here's the examples. So let's just use the one we just looked at. All right. So now we have the name of the file, and it says, all right, now component one was pure water, component two was everything you measured in AC9. So what do you want to use for the phase function? Well, I have a bunch of discretized phase functions ready to go, and if you wanted to use Petzl, for example, there's somewhere here, it says average particle, that's the Petzold one, Petzold average particle. And DPF just means discretized phase function. It's really just a text file, but it's all fixed up and ready to go in Hydrolyte. So if I wanted to use Petzold to go with this, that's what I want. If I want a Fournier-Ferrand guy, I can put in a backscatter fraction. Or I can let the backscatter fraction be a power law and wavelength. If I pick that one, it will do it in a minute. Or I can say, I actually have a file of backscatter data. So let's use that and then use the ratio of backscatter to total scatter to get a fournier farad that varies with depth and wavelength. So if I wanted to pick that option, I would say, let's go over here and we'll get the hydroscat file with the water. Oops. And I'll check that that file includes the pure water backscatter. Okay, that'll do what it needs to do now. Let me explain another little something here. Okay, so here's your AC9 data. So this is wavelength, and uh, let's do depth. And so we have a 412. And so here's depth zero, and it goes down to 50 meters. OK, so at 412 nanometers, your AC9 started making its measurement at, say, 1.2 meters depth. And it's making these measurements, and they quit at, uh, let's say, 30 meters depth. And then here's, you know, 443 whatever it looked like. Okay, when Hydrolyte comes along and it runs, and you said, I want to run from 350 to 800 nanometers, and I want to run down to 50 meters depth. You haven't defined your IOPs over that whole range. So what Hydrolyte is going to do is it's going to say, OK, I'm at the first wavelength. I'm at 350 nanometers and depth zero. Well, it doesn't have any IOPs there. So it's going to say, use the closest one I have, which is this point is go going to be used all the way back to 350, and it's going to be used from here up to the surface. So it will then print a nasty message in the printout file that says, Remember, you gave me IOPs that started at 412, but the run started at 350, so you're probably not getting good values back to 350. Maybe at 400, but not at 350. So be, you know, 
be very cautious of your output. If it looks strange, it's probably wrong. Likewise, if you run down to 50 meters, you'll get a message that says your IOP is ended at 30 meters, so I'm just going to use that value all the way down to 50. And if something looks a little strange, it's because you didn't really give me the IOPs, I'm just guessing. And then out here, there's finally some IOPs at 715, and you said run all the way out to 800, so it's going to use these values all the way out to 800. And you know, it might not matter because pure water absorption is so high out here, but it might matter. So just be forewarned that you've really defined IOPs between 412 and 715 and between 1.2 meters or, and 30. And it's going to just expand that area out to get whatever IOPs it needs. So it's a little, little tricky there. The other thing is let's say hydrolyte is now at 3 meters depth and it says I need the IOPs at 3 meters. Okay, what you have, here's lambda, and let's say this is the absorption coefficient, and it's, here's the values at your nine wavelengths, whatever they happen to look like. So it's going to use the 412 value down to here. Then if you come along and, you know, this is 412, this is 443, but you told Hydrolyte to run every five nanometers. Well, it is then going to need to know the IOPs at every five nanometers because it's going to do a run at 410, 415, 420, 25, 30, so on. It's simply going to do linear interpolation between the values it has. Simplest thing I could do. And so that's the way it works. And then, like I say, up here it's going to use the first value up to the surface and the last value down to however deep you did the run. So just keep that in mind that when in doubt it extends data and then it linearly interpolates between the values you have. And of course here, in this case, here are our AC9 wavelengths and it's going to interpolate in those to get A and C and B but maybe here's our uh, hydroscat 6 wavelengths. Those are different wavelengths, and it'll just interpolate those and to get the values it needs. So those wavelengths don't have to be the same. The other warning is if you read in ACS data, the actual instrument puts out the same number of wavelengths for A and C, but they're not exactly the same. And so the way these standard files are set up goes back to AC9s when the A and the C had the same wavelengths. So when you process ACS data, in the processing, spline it or something and interpolate your data to the common set of wavelengths for A and C. So that might be every 5 nanometers or every 10 or something. But Hydrolyte's just going to read that set of, let's say, 80 wavelengths, and it's going to assume that both A and C have exactly those wavelengths. So if you don't clean up your ACS data and interpolate to a common set of wavelengths, the, the wavelengths for the C part are going to be a little bit off because it'll be using the wavelengths for the A part. And the big kids that have these tell me that it's standard procedure to interpolate your ACS data to a common set of wavelengths that you ought to just routinely do that. Uh, I've never played with any, so I don't know. Okay, so anyway, we've now defined our IOPs with our own data. It comes along here. Okay, let's include the chlorophyll fluorescence stuff. And it says, uh, in fact, let's just leave off CDOM for the moment. The next thing it does is it comes up and says, well, wait a minute, I don't know what the chlorophyll value is. And so I can't include chlorophyll fluorescence unless I know the chlorophyll. And you say, well, I didn't measure chlorophyll because that's why I bought an AC9 was so I could measure the IOPs directly rather than measure chlorophyll and use a bio-optical model. 
Well, that's fine if you don't include chlorophyll fluorescence. You can use your AC9, but in order to do the chlorophyll fluorescence, you need to know how much chlorophyll there is. So once again, you could put in a value. If you've read, if you measured your chlorophyll, which you did because you're now competent scientist, you could go over and say, here's my chlorophyll profile that I measured. Whoops and I will use that one. And then it wants to know, okay, I now know what the chlorophyll concentration is, what's the chlorophyll specific absorption? Because I need to know how this chlorophyll is going to absorb the light. Well, maybe and you took a bunch of samples and you ran this through the spectrophotometer and you got a chlorophyll specific absorption spectrum you put that on a standard format file that says wavelength value, wavelength value. You could use that or you could say, oh, well, I didn't do that. Let's just use this little model for case one water that says, uh, you know, a, a certain shape chlorophyll to the 0.65 and we'll just hope for the best. So at any rate now, it knows the shape of the chlorophyll s absorption spectrum and then the concentration, kale. Why is what? What? Why is it saying why is C to the zero point six five? Oh well, that's the actual model that's in that classic case one IOP model, and this A star of lambda here is, you know, four hundred to seven hundred. It's a shape of a chlorophyll specific spectrum, which is just an sort of average of a bunch of spectra measured by Shuba Sethyendranath. And so that's just a model for case one water that's probably way incorrect for your water body today, but if you didn't measure it, it's the best thing you can do. Okay, and that's actually, like I say, you're actually using this when you run that classic case one IOP model. Okay, so now it's happy, and it sort of warns you that this chlorophyll you just put in here better be consistent with your AC9 data. So if it's not, you'll get some weird result. And so it just tells you where it's going to get this info. Okay, fine. And that because you've included inelastic, you need to make sure you include the right wavelengths. Okay, fine. Now the rest of it's just the same as you've already seen. You put in what wavelengths you want, let's say 400 to 700 by 10. And then, uh, you know, the wind speed, uh, the sun angle here, all this kind of stuff, it's all the same. So let's just put the sun at 30 degrees today and we'll let it be a clear sky. Since it's Thursday, it's always sunny. Uh, this day of the year, it's left over from the last run where we put in latitude, longitude, July the 15th or whatever. Uh, that's the runs we did yesterday. We'll just move to the annual average. Um, and we're going to call the RADTRAN uh, model. Now, if I have a deck cell like you guys had out here, you actually measured the sky irradiances. Once again, we can say, okay, fine, let's read those guys in. There's three different ways you can do that. You measured the total. ED or you measured the direct and diffuse or you measured the total and you put in what fraction is diffuse. But anyway, for the moment, let's just use RADTRAN. Uh, but if you really want to do really accurate work, you need to measure your sky irradiance and use that, especially if it's a partly cloudy day because RADTRAN's sky irradiance model is for clear skies. So. If you want to compare measured EDs with the ones you got, you better put in a measured sky irradiance. Okay, there's that. Let's say the water's infinitely deep. Uh, let's uh, click that. And then we're going to run it down to 50 meters uh, and save the output, let's say, every 10 meters. Good enough. Now, of course, there's no option for doing optical depths because 
each wavelength 50 meters would be a different optical depth so it has to be in meters and that's what your AC 9 data is in anyway okay we can save that for the next run and then let's just do the Ecolite run and get it over with here so away it goes so now we're doing a run with your AC9 data, your backscatter data, maybe your sky irradiance data, and so on. And now, same story, you know, it's created the printout files, the Excel files, and all of that stuff. So let's just go do another batch run now, and we'll call that run two. And now let's do example case two data. Our model. I mean the AC9 may have been case 2 water. So let's just do one where now I say I want to build up the the IOPs component by component and there's a little generic four component model here which is water plus phytoplankton plus minerals plus CDOM but there's also I, I've written this 10 component model that people can use. We're not going to bother with that in there. And I think that's probably grayed out in your version anyway, because to use that, it would require the code to recompile. OK, so we're going to do the case two thing. And it goes, comes up and says, OK, here's the components. Pure water, chlorophyll, CDOM, and minerals. And now we're going to go through one at a time and specify what we want for those component IOPs. So. Bingo. All right, so pure water, we're OK. Uh, we're in seawater. Now it says component two was chlorophyll. So how are we going to model that? Well, just for ease here, see, it's, this is left over from the previous run because I said save those inputs for the next run. Uh, so I could just use that chlorophyll profile. Fine, let's do it. I could specify. The absorption coefficient, uh, same sort of way I did. Let's just do that. And the scattering coefficient, well, there's various ways. I can, if I had a, a file of measured chlorophyll specific scattering coefficients, click here, read in that file. That's the best way, but you probably didn't measure that. So then we could say, well, yes, let's use a power law. So. The scattering coefficient will be some constant times the concentration to a power and wavelength to some minus m. And there's several ways to do that. This all got started with Gordon and Morell using a little equation like that. And so I could say, OK, let's do that. And we'll pick the old Gordon and Morell values. But then Emmanuel comes along and says, well, you know, if you use this kind of formula, you actually get better results for beam attenuation than you do for scattering. He gave a talk on that the other day. So let's use the little power law for beam C, and then it'll get B from C minus A, and away you'll go. And then Loisel and Morel came along. They did some studies, and they came up with values for near surface water which is what you're going to want to use if you're doing remote sensing, or they came up with average values over the whole water column. So let's say we're going to do remote sensing. We're really interested in computing RRSs. So let's do this for C, and let's use their values for the near surface. Or if you have better values for these little coefficients, you know, you can read in your values. And there's another model that some people use uh, by Gould et al. That's there. It's available. And then if you wanted to make things independent of wavelength, okay, you could do that, but that's kind of artificial. So let's just go with that. Okay, now we have still have to pick the phase function. So let's pick a phase function with the backscatter value that's specified by a power law, just to see how that works. All right. So here it is. I'm going to say that the backscatter fraction is some reference value, wavelength to some power, etc. So I'm going to say that backscatter 
is 1% at 550, and it looks like wavelength to the um, minus 0.5, let's say, just to pull it out. So you can make the backscatter fraction a function of wavelength if you want to. Okay, so let's just pick those values. Oh, sorry, hang on, let's go back. Uh, just to say, I might have made it 50% here. Hang on, if I, uh, with the screen resolution, I can't get down to the, to what I need to click down here. That's weird. Uh, not a problem I've hit before. Let's see, what do I need to do here? Uh, now, Kurt, yeah. Make it smaller. Yeah, here we go. Okay, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, right. I'm waking up. I didn't get my siesta today. Okay, so now here, though, I still can't get down to here. I still need, I need to go back one. Well, tell you what, we're going to live with that. It's a perfectly good radiative transfer problem. It just may not correspond to the ocean. Uh, and so let's just go ahead and, and define the CDOM here. And, uh, you know, when I'm not giving a talk, I have my full screen resolution and life is good. It's only when I plug into the projector that's low resolution that it cuts off things. Um, Okay, so we now need to specify CDOM somewhere. So I could just say, you know, I've, I'm going to put in some constant value. Well, that constant value is actually CDOM at a reference wavelength. So I might say at 440 nanometers, CDOM is 0.1 per meter, and then I'll pick some function to define the other wavelengths. So let's just do that. Uh, what the heck? So let's say 0.1, and then it says, okay, that's really the value at, at one wavelength, and now we have to specify the wavelength dependence. So I'm going to say, let's use an exponential function, and it's the 0.1 at 440, and it has the minus 0.014 kind of wavelength dependence that Colin talked about. Good enough. Okay. And then we go back to here. Um, if we had uh, somewhere here, yeah, we could have right here picked this and read in our file of filtered AC9 data to get the CDOM absorption part. Another, another option. Okay, so I have... Uh, I have totally screwed myself up here. If you hover the mouse underneath, under the, uh, the window, it should go down automatically. Yeah, come on, window. If you just unplug the screen. Be back shortly. Okay, now I can hit continue. <laughs> All right. Now, we can plug you guys back in. Talk about high tech, man. I, I'm at the, I am at the cutting edge of computer science here. Um, okay, so now we're up to the mineral particles. And we can do the same thing. We can read in a file of concentrations. We can read in, you know, mineral particle absorption and scattering mass specific absorption and scattering coefficients, etc. Suppose we want to do a run where there's no mineral particles. Just put in a zero for the concentration and then we'll still it'll still say you need to specify the mineral particle absorption and scattering spectra. So let's just pick this and if you look here in the defaults file data defaults Here's an A star mineral for so an average of a bunch of minerals. There's brown earth, calcareous sand, red clay, yellow clay, etc. So let's just pick the one for, 
I don't know, red clay. Uh, and then we'll use that. I, okay, this, this is, these are in the HE52 data defaults directory. And I have, if you, once again, if you look in the technical documentation, there's plots of all these spectra in here. So here's, here's a plot that has, this is the mineral mass specific scattering spectra versus wavelength for the different ones, and somewhere there's the one that has the absorption spectra. So if you want to see what the red clay mass specific absorption spectrum looks like, it's plotted in here, or you can open the file in Excel and plot it. All right, so let's just say we'll pick the A star for red clay, and then we'll use that. It's going to come back and say, What's, what do you want to use for scattering? Well, if I pick the A star for red clay for absorption, we better pick the B star the mass specific absorption for red clay for the scattering part. Now, if you pick absorption for yellow clay and scattering for red clay, Hydrolyte will take it and run, and you'll just get some result that's not really what you expected because you had sort of a mix of absorption coefficients for one thing and scattering for the other, but it will work. And so you can also do all the power laws and all of that stuff. But in this case, we're putting in a concentration of zero. So whatever we picked for the absorption and scattering mass specific spectra is just going to get multiplied by zero. Now, if I put in 1.2 here, then it's, that's going to be read as 1.2 grams per cubic meter, and you'll add minerals into the thing. OK, enough said. Once again, same story here. Uh, if we include all the inelastic scattering, and it says, OK, I'm going to find uh, wherever my laser pen went. It says, I'm going to get uh, the chlorophyll concentration from the file you gave me. I'm going to assume the CDOM is constant with depth and has a value of 0.1 per meter at the 440 reference wavelength, I think it was and it already knows about Raman, so you're good to go. And then once again now, you can do whatever wavelengths and all of that you want. That's all the same as you've already learned how to do. So there's wind speed, sun angles, uh, all of that. We'll use RADTRAN. Uh, you know, we'll make it finite depth, and let's put brown algae on the bottom and we'll, whoops, we'll let it go down to eight meters and we'll save the output every meter, for example. So now we'll click that, we'll save all that for the next run. Now one thing here I'll show you, on the changing the output options, I normally, it always saves the printout. I normally save these two Excel files, but then there's a file that's all of this stuff in one big file for reading into IDL. I'm not going to bother with that, but I will check the box that says generate a file containing the full radiance distribution. And you may want to go in and look at your output and get radiances in particular directions. Say. Yeah, the output options. So let's, for this run, that can be a big file, and let's just pick that. So you pick the change output options, and we'll save that, and then... Okay, on the last form, I did change output options, and I checked the box to create the full file with the full radiance distribution, just so we can look at that. Oh, no, sorry, I don't. I recommend the standard printout is what we've been getting. This is just a little bit, and then this is a massive bunch of printout if there's, you know, something you really do want it for. But, yeah, I use the standard. Okay, 
So let's save those values for the next run. And now let's just do the hydrolyte run. And this might take a while, but uh, that's OK. I know there's nothing more that you like to do more than listen to me talk. So um, and of course, I'm a real stickler for proper grammar. But I don't hold it against you if you have a bad accent, because English is not my native language either. I grew up in Texas, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's been the great curse of my life. And of course, if I go to Texas, they all think I talk like I'm from Maine or somewhere. And if I come up here, they say, my god, you know, where'd you get that hideous southern accent? So OK, I guess. I'm going to have to unplug again here. Um, what a pain in the butt. Come on, go away. I don't know. Like you said, this little guy should disappear, but I may have it set so that that's always there. Um, let me go to the higher screen resolution until I can open Windows Explorer. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'll leave that open next time. Uh, I just want to look at that one file of the Radiance Info. So if we go to HE5, yeah, yeah, Output, Hydrolyte, and then the digital directory gets these files of the Radiance distribution. And so here's the L for day two, run two. And if we open that guy, it's simply a file you know, with a bunch of info that tells you exactly what's on the file. And then there's a big pile of depth, theta, phi, wavelength. Then it says total radiance. Now there's actually four columns. So I said here, depth minus one labels values in the air just above the sea surface. And then L sky uh, is there. The water leaving radiance is there. The surface reflected. And then uh, so this is actually, I think it says, uh, yeah, total radiance. And then L sky, if it's in the air, and we're in the air here, or it's the direct part in the water. And then this column is LW, water leaving, or the diffuse part. And then the last guy out here is the surface reflected part. And uh, so uh, I think that's what that is, surface reflected. OK, so anyway, um, the reason the surface reflected is 0 there is that it says something about the L sky is only theta equals 0 to 90 degrees. So we only have a downwelling sky radiance. We don't have an upwelling sky part. Uh, and then we have the water leaving part. So there's that. And then it says up here somewhere that, uh, yeah, theta equals 0 to 90 is downwelling. 90 to 180 is upwelling. Uh, depth minus one flags values in the air. So there's an initial block of value that's the above surface values. If you want to know in any particular direction what's the water leaving radiance, what's the sky radiance, if I look in that direction, how much surface reflected radiance there is, it's in that file. And then if we go down a little ways, we'll get to, and see there's a lot of data there because there's every theta and phi and every wavelength. Let's just go down here. That's why, OK. So somewhere down here, we'll finally get to depth 0. All right. And the depth 0 means you're in the water just below the surface and then all the remaining depths. So let's just get up here. Let me 
like I say, you don't normally look at this with a text editor, but it's all there. Okay, so there's depth zero, and uh, okay, come on, we're getting there. Okay, so here's from the in the air value, the last theta, the last phi, and this is the first, we're, we're going to do all the first wavelengths, then we'll do all the other wavelengths. Now we're in the water, theta, phi, wavelength, and now there's one less column. We don't have sky and surface reflected. We have the total, the direct, and the diffuse. And the direct beam is whatever has made it down to your depth unscattered and then the diffuse is all the scattered radiance and then the total is the sum of those two. So if you do want all that information it's there and there are IDL routines that will read this and plot it all up but notice this file is 11 megabytes so you don't normally do this with with a text editor you just look at it uh, you know graphically. All right, so that's really about all I want to say now. Let's just get you guys to, uh, to running HydroLite. And so here's the usual homework problems. There's one of them on inputting a chlorophyll Z profile, and you can make up your own numbers, whatever you want. Uh, inputting IOPs from AC and BB sensors simulating case two water, simulating optically shallow water, and then there's one that is a real world hydrolyte user support problem. And we'll see uh, if you guys would uh, want to go to work for me doing hydrolyte user support. And take a look in your data slash user directory and see if there's a file in there that should be called something like uh, lab AC9 data or example or something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I think that's it. And the rest of them back here. So just work your way through these. Then uh, I'll be in the back for questions. And then tomorrow, give the little lab report on whatever you learned on each of these problems here.